After their failed attempt to open a restaurant in their brother John's honor, and after being thrown in the middle of all the pizza and cheese war drama, things got worse for Joe and Rosario. On Tuesday, March 18, 1980, while enjoying an evening at Valentino's, federal agents arrested the two brothers on charges of conspiracy to smuggle 91 pounds of heroin into the U.S. from Milan, Italy. The crackdown, dubbed the Milan Connection, was a combined effort between the FBI and the Italian police, and other arrests were made that night as well. Domenico Emanuel and Antonio Adamito were arrested in Italy. Paul Rizzuto, who hailed from Italy as well, was arrested during a card game at John's Cafe Valentino in Bensonhurst. He was a manager there. Rizzuto was also a day manager at Tiffany's Pizza Restaurant in Lower Manhattan, which was owned by Emanuel Adamita. Italian police seized heroin at Antonio's home in Milan, which had been packaged in metal containers and placed in a cardboard box destined for Centro Nostri Italian distributors on 18th Avenue in Brooklyn, which happened to be located right across the street from John's Cafe Valentino. According to authorities, the drugs had an estimated street value between $70 and $120 million, though the actual value would fluctuate as the case went on. Originally, Judge John F. Jerry had set Joe and Rosario's bail at $3 million each based on a recommendation from a Brooklyn judge after prosecutors told him that without a high bail, the Gambino brothers might attempt to flee the country. However, when Joe and Rosario appeared at their bail hearing on March 20th, Judge Jerry changed his mind and reduced their bail to $250,000 each, saying, on one hand, these brothers are suspected of having committed a terribly serious crime. On the other hand, they have roots in the community. Prosecutors were none too happy and argued that Joe and Rosario should be required to pay the full bail because they were, according to them, the principal movers of heroin in the United States. Judge Jerry didn't agree. He told prosecutors that this court will not engage in speculation engendered by the last names of the defendants. Joe and Rosario were freed after posting only $25,000 each. All of the defendants were to be tried in both Italy and the U.S. at a later date. But the fun was just beginning. Angelo Bruno, the godfather of South Jersey and Philadelphia, was buried today. Last Friday night, two shotgun blasts ended Bruno's life on the street in front of his house in South Philadelphia. And this morning, more than a thousand people crowded around a small church just a few blocks away. Steve Taylor was there. A wall of curious faces gave way reluctantly when the heavy bronze coffin arrived at the Church of the Epiphany of Our Lord. Inside, about 250 relatives, friends, and associates waited for the remains of Angelo Bruno. The funeral was private. The thousand or so people outside, many from the neighborhood, had nearly an hour to think about the mafia and about the ways men can die. Last year, there were two mob-style killings which may be related to the Bruno shooting. Carmine Galante was murdered in the garden of a Brooklyn restaurant, and Anthony Little Pussy Russo died near his Monmouth County office. Some informers say these shootings had to do with a mob dispute over control of Atlantic City. The same sources say Bruno was shot by two hitmen from an organization in Hoboken hired by the New York mob. But there have been no arrests and police say they haven't got any suspects. After the funeral, Bruno's widow and children were the first to come out. Among the many mourners who followed were Rosario and Giuseppe Gambino, cousins of the late New York crime boss Carlo Gambino. Just last week, the Gambino brothers were charged with drug trafficking in New Jersey. There were 30 limousines in the funeral procession, and they were joined by dozens of other cars for the half-hour drive to the cemetery, where Angelo Bruno was buried in a family plot. In Yadin, Pennsylvania, just outside Philadelphia, I'm Steve Taylor. On the evening of Friday, March 21st, three days after Joe and Rosario were arrested, 
and one day after they were released on bail, Angelo Bruno, the boss of the Bruno crime family in Philadelphia, was murdered. He had been sitting in his car outside his home when he was killed by a shotgun blast to the back of the head. Almost immediately, Joe and Rosaria were the stars of this new soap opera. Newspapers started reporting information given to them by anonymous law enforcement sources that Joe and Rosaria were involved in the murder. One report said that Bruno, who was notoriously known as being against drug dealing, had learned about the Gambino smuggling operation that previous fall while in Milan with Nicodemo Scarfo and then tipped police. Bruno had also happened to make an appearance at the SCI offices in Trenton the morning of his murder. And unlike his previous appearances, he wasn't being brought before the Superior Court judge to answer questions as he had a few months earlier. Coincidentally, Bruno was being represented by Sal Avina at that meeting, the same attorney who was representing Joe in the smuggling case. However, Michael Siavage, executive director of the SCI, squashed those rumors, saying that if SCI testimony had anything to do with it, he would have been killed three years ago. But the SCI never revealed why Bruno was at their offices that day, and the theories being handed out to the media by law enforcement sources were changing daily. As an interesting side note, after Bruno's killing, John Stampa, who was Bruno's chauffeur and was wounded when Bruno was murdered, had testified before a grand jury about Bruno's murder. He was accused of perjury soon after and had disappeared after an arrest warrant was issued. Law enforcement originally thought he might have been killed, but he had just went on the lam. They found him a few months later living under an assumed name in Landover, Maryland. Authorities learned that a car he had been using was registered to A.W. Aspen Construction Company, which just happened to be owned by Emmanuel Matty Gambino of Shelburne Hotel fame, the Gambino brothers, and others. Stanford was also working at Luciano's Pizza Parlor in Landover, which was owned by the Gambinos. So those were some of the many reasons why authorities tried to link the Gambino brothers to Bruno's murder. But as it turned out, they were never officially implicated in the assassination, and the wild rumors that circulated at that time were just that, rumors, which seemed to be the story of their lives. It also wouldn't be the last time law enforcement tried to link the Gambino brothers to some dastardly deeds either. But even though a drug trial was looming ahead, Joe and Rosario forged ahead and continued to do what they did best, running successful businesses. In July 1980, Joe decided he wanted to reinvent Valentino's Supper Club to attract a more mature crowd. He closed it temporarily to do some remodeling, as well as create a new menu and a new name for it. At the same time, Rosario opened a new disco called The Late Show, the club didn't sell alcohol, which made it a popular spot for the 15 to 18 year old crowd who didn't have many places to hang out in Cherry Hill. Valentino's reopened in late September 1980 as a New York, New York. It offered a new Italian continental menu featuring such items as Via Rolatini a la New York, New York, steak and lobster, as well as a variety of pastas. It got great reviews and became almost as popular as Valentino's. For the late show, however, it wasn't as rosy. Law enforcement officials weren't too thrilled that the Gambino brothers were going about their business as usual. They seemed to forget that Joe and Rosario had only been accused of drug smuggling, not convicted. Still, they seemed to target the brothers every chance they could, especially Rosario. In September 1980, only a few short months after it opened, a huge fight took place in the parking lot of The Late Show. Police said that the fight broke out between several young men who used their hands, knives, car ashtrays, and crowbars. Over 400 people had gathered outside to cheer on the fighting, and over 25 cops from Cherry Hill and surrounding areas were called in to put a stop to the brawl. One man was stabbed, but survived. The Cherry Hill Town Council immediately revoked the club's amusement license. During the investigation, 
Camden County prosecutors discovered that Rosario had signed an agreement with local police, promising not to allow alcohol on the premises, even with the BYOB law that was in effect for clubs without a liquor license. They also discovered that township building officials knew of the Gambino brothers' history, but gave them the necessary permits to open anyway. One building official told the Courier Post, the Gambinos are a part of the scenery of Cherry Hill. They may be the mafia, but they deserve the same treatment as anybody else from this office. At a town council hearing prompted by Rosario's legal appeals to keep the club open, David Maitland of the Cherry Hill Police Department testified that Rosario was uncooperative during the fight. I spoke to Rosario Gambino and told him to hold everyone inside, Maitland testified. He just laughed and said what was going on outside was our problem. Although Rosario's lawyer was present at the meeting, Rosario wasn't. So whether that interaction happened is anyone's guess, as there was no indication that Rosario had been contacted to refute that story. The town council upheld the license revocation anyway, claiming the club failed to maintain order and decorum and created a public nuisance, which was a violation of a township ordinance and just cause for the revocation. Councilman Moro DeFrank said, we must set an example to the owners that they have as much responsibility to maintain order as we have and as our police have. The club was closed permanently. Back in Brooklyn, John was quietly watching the madness unfold in Cherry Hill. He may have been concerned, but there were bigger events unfolding in his native home of Sicily, and he'd need to conjure up some of his best charismatic magic to stop a disaster. Who would want to travel to Italy to meet with the most ruthless mobster in history? especially when it was killing your family members left and right. Well, according to several sources, that's exactly what John did. Totorina, who was the powerful head of the Corleonese family and the boss of all bosses in Sicily, had started slaying his rivals in what was called the Second Mafia War in that country. Rina's main focus was the Paso di Regano family, headed by John's cousin and associate Salvatore Inzerillo as well as the families headed by Inzerillo's close allies, Stefano Bontati and Gaetano Badalamenti. While some sources say that the war started because these families were challenging Rina's power, other sources state it had more to do with all the money those families were making in the drug trafficking business. Profits they were not sharing with the beast, Rina's nickname. Whatever the true cause of the second mafia war, John's family and associates in Italy were in trouble. Rina first assassinated Bontati in April 1981. Then in May, Inzerillo was killed. What followed was a massacre with nearly 1,000 men losing their lives in the bloody battle between 1981 and 1983. Rina had also ordered the assassination of any Inzerillo who tried to flee to the U.S. At some point, Gambino boss Paul Castellano reportedly sent John to Italy to defuse the situation. But it seems more likely that John went on his own because of his very strong ties to Inzerillo and others, including Rina himself, and reported the situation to Castellano rather than Castellano asking him to go in the first place. But there is no information to substantiate that, and it's also not clear when exactly John traveled to Italy. When he did go to try to quell the volatile situation, he met with Rina to negotiate for the lives of his Italian friends, family, and associates. Against all odds, his magic worked. The Inzerillos were allowed to live, but they would be banished from Italy. They became known as the Gliscapati, or the Runaways. Soon after, two Inzerillos affiliated with the Gambino family were killed under mysterious circumstances perhaps as a warning from Rina to follow the rules, or perhaps as a way to appease the beast. First, Antonino Nino Inzerillo, John's brother-in-law and the capo of the South Jersey crew, disappeared in October 1981. According to LCN Bios, Sammy Gravano had testified that Castellano had ordered the hit on Nino because of the war. It was alleged that John had lured him to a deli in Brooklyn 
where another Gambino family member committed the murder. Nino's body was never found. Pietro Inzarillo was found murdered in January 1982. He was the brother of Salvatore Inzarillo and an alleged soldier in John's crew. His body was found frozen stiff in the trunk of a car, handcuffed, shot several times in the head, and wrapped in a plastic bag. A $5 bill was stuffed in his mouth, and a $2 bill was on his genitals. The murder was never solved. Even after successfully saving his brethren, John didn't have a lot of room to breathe. But luck was on his side, at least temporarily. This is the end of part three of our now six-part Cherry Hill Gambino series. Yes, it was only supposed to be four parts, but it's going to be broken into six parts because there's a lot of additional fun things that I found for you guys that I think you'll enjoy. So thank you for your patience, and I hope the video was worth the wait. Let me know. Be sure to hit the notification button if you haven't already so when part four goes live in the next couple of days, you'll be alerted. And while you're at it, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button so you won't miss any of our future episodes. And please leave a comment and let us know what you think about the Cherry Hill Gambinos Part 3 or any of our other mob tales. We welcome your feedback and look forward to your suggestions for future episodes and articles. You can also visit us at thenewyorkmafia.com and indulge yourself in our vast library of tales from the underworld. And follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook to stay up to date with everything new that's happening in the Button Guys media world. Until next time.